the first panel is really going to look at this question of what is techonomy and does it make sense as a concept and uh, how do we make it more understood if it does make sense. So, yeah, Kevin, this is good. Right in the right order. You guys are excellent. Thank you. Thank we do you. as we're brigade. You know, we do what we're told. So, um, so here we have Kevin Kelly, who's uh, one of the founding editors of Wired and has written a book called What Technology Wants, which if you didn't notice, we have copies of out in front, even though it's not published for a month or so, two months. Uh, we got special advanced galleys for everyone here. So that's a real treat, because we feel that his book is probably the best explanation of what we believe uh, of anything we've run across. Uh, Debbie Hopkins, uh, what's your exact title here? It's uh, yeah, Chairman of Venture Capital Initiatives and Chief Innovation Officer of City, but really a, a, a representative of, in effect, old industry thinking smart. Eric Schmidt doesn't need much introduction, example of new industry thinking smart. Uh, and finally, Lisa Randall, who is a theoretical physicist uh, at Harvard University and uh, somebody who's writing her own book about science and how it's conducted uh, and, and a very big thinker. So we're very happy to have her. So um, oh, before I get started, I want to just say the reason I'm holding this is that in addition to the comments and questions we want you to make uh, by standing up and saying your name when someone hands you the mic, and we will be happy to do that, you're also welcome to tweet in questions, uh, at least during the sessions that we announced that for, and we're, I think they're gonna, we're going to do it for a lot of them. And the, uh, so the way to do that is to put at TCMYQA at the beginning of your tweet, at TCMYQA, oh, we got it up there, thank you. Um, and you, you can start doing that as soon as the session begins. I'll be looking at that on this little thing here. Uh, but we do want to hear from you in person if you feel like it. Um, so we've tried to define techonomy briefly before on stage. Um, and I guess rather than say any more introductory remarks, I don't think it's necessary. Peter and Brent did an excellent job of that. But Kevin, you, know, you are what we consider a techonomist par excellence, and your book really does articulate some of these ideas. When you think about what, what we're trying to do and you hear what we're saying about it, does it make sense to you? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think the, the, the kind of thought that sort of slowly dawned on lots of us is that technology is really the most powerful force in the world. I mean, there's really, there's nothing else. If, if it's, whenever you trace something happening in the world, you can usually trace it back to some new technology that has been introduced. And, um, I use a very broad definition of technology, just as, just as you do. Um, for me, it's very close to almost being culture, but there's a difference between culture and technology. I think uh, we tend to think of technology as hard stuff, wires, gadgets, you know, lasers and things, but of course, um, law can be technology, um, uh, a, a novel can be technology, um, and so uh, that goes into the realm of culture, but the difference between culture and technology as we normally understand it is that technology and the technium as I define it entails this idea that all the things that we're making are so interdependent, so woven together, so vast that they form an emergent behavior, emergent thing itself that is more than just a passive culture, it's actually dynamic. It actually responds, it has its own emergent behaviors, it has its own tendencies, it has, is in a certain sense, its own agency. But that doesn't mean it's inexorable and we can just sit back and wait for it to happen, right? Not at all, because what's happening is that we're still involved because we are it's ourselves technology. We, we, we have invented ourselves. Technology is anything that comes from our mind. The first animal that we domesticated was humanity, humans. We've made ourselves. And so we're still making ourselves. We're still inventing ourselves. We're not done yet. We have physically changed our bodies through agriculture. Our, we have an extended stomach called cooking, and that has changed our teeth and jaws. Uh, our genes are now changing 100 times faster than they were 10,000 years ago. So we are still in the process of remaking ourselves. So we are both masters of technology, and we are also the children of technology, both at the same time. And we will never, ever escape from that tension between being the subject and, and, and the object of, of, of our inventions. And so we still have agency, but we have to recognize that this thing that we have made also has agency. And so my question that I've been asking is, well, if it has agency, what does it want? Hmm. Thank you, that's interesting. So to go from that very macro view to a more pragmatic way of looking at this, in terms of you know, technology changing us, this is something inside city, 
in a big company, you are concretely attempting to change the entire enterprise through a different way of thinking about technology. Just quickly talk about how you think about that and what you're doing at Citi, Debbie. Absolutely. I think as we really, when Vikram Panda came in to be CEO at the really at the beginning of the financial crisis, um, and he was looking around, he said, I better have some people thinking about the future. And really, we went to work a couple of years ago trying to create a much more human connection to both our clients and our customers, really trying to understand how they want to live their lives and how we can empower that. So it's a very, very different way of thinking about pushing product out the door. It's much more bringing, bringing them inside and understanding how we have to create a very different interaction with these individuals. And it was uh, Brent mentioned about um, you know, much less vertical. This is what we talk about a lot. It's flipping that on its side, that the future is really about the horizontal. It's about partnerships and collaboration. And this is how we do our work. So it's, it's a very exciting way to change the way we bring capabilities to our customers, our clients, cities, which we think are a really important part of all this, because we see the world becoming so urban um, and, and in fact, instead of being a set of countries, a connection of connecting dots between cities. And that is really kind of front and center of how we're thinking about really creating a different interaction. We're going to hear a lot more about that cities thing over the next couple of days, but can you be concrete about one or two things you've done at City as a result of Absolutely. this mindset? Absolutely. Um, we really started a few years ago uh, changing the approach to transit um, and created, um, started out kind of as a little idea, putting a chip on a card and then people get into a transit system in Singapore and then grew into a very cool, different way of saying, well, millions of people on their way every day go through subway stations. What if we created an opportunity for them to engage with us on their way instead of making them come to us? So we created a very high-tech, high-touch environment for them where they could get things done on their way to work, which then grew to um, a very exciting project that is our first example, I think, of what I call systems design, where we fundamentally redid the entire consumer banking pro uh, approach in Japan um, and totally took out paper, took 150 processes, netted it to 12, and created a very, very different way for our customers to come into their neighborhoods and have an engagement. And it's been very exciting to see the reaction. That's great. So Eric, you know, we, we at Techonomy, me, me personally, think of Google as probably the ultimately techonomic company. You know, moving quickly, uh, absolutely a believer in the power of technology to make the world a better place and to solve our problems. So when you hear this techonomy idea of ours, does that make sense to you? Um, it does, and I'll put it in the context of my daily life, which is I spend most of my time assuming that the world is not ready for the technology revolution that will be happening to them relatively soon. One, because people don't understand what's going to happen, and second, because of the compounding that's occurring. Uh, there were five exabytes of information created in, by the entire world between the dawn of civilization in 2003. Now that same amount is created every two days. No wonder we're sort of overloaded. Uh, we can now... Wait, every two days we create as much as we created up till 2003? That is correct. And by the way, the growth rate, of course, is accelerating. It's probably faster this month. Um, I'll give you another example. With uh, online, with these sorts of devices... Is that because of all those trucks you're driving around taking our Wi-Fi? Betcha. <laughs> but, but, but the real issue is the, all, the real issue is user-generated content. People are describing enormous amounts of things about themselves, yeah. video and photographs and so forth. So you take this sort of device, right, and with products like Google Latitude, you can tell, tell us where you are, and then you can tell your friends where you are. Well, we can, using AI techniques, predict where you're going to go. Hmm, pretty interesting. Good idea, bad idea. We can take a picture. And if you have 14 pictures on the internet within a 95% confidence interval, we can predict who you are. Now, you say you don't have 14 pictures? You have Facebook pictures, so there. Right? So all of a sudden, a lot of assumptions that we make about daily life are going away. Um, and, and that kind of could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what we do with that data. Obviously. Well, the, the first place, the technology, of course, is neutral. And, but society is not fundamentally ready for the questions that are going to be asked by the explosion of right. user-powered technology of one kind or another. And I think it's time for people to get ready for it. And now that's going right to the main question we ask here. Can the world be turned in a more economic direction, which would be really about, you know, will we be able to move forward? Will enough people understand what can be done? And will they do it in the most productive way, given the scope of our problems? I mean, you spend a lot of time talking to heads of state, CEOs of all kinds of companies, and government leaders all over the place. 
Do you feel like there is an understanding of the centrality that technology is playing in modern uh, life? It's completely predictable by the age of the person you're talking to. So the people who are quite old acknowledge it, but ask their secretary to read their email to them. Uh, people who are in my generation ha can read their email, but they don't understand quite what instant messaging and Twitter is. Um, and folks of the generation below that sort of get it. I don't think there is a consensus, though, at societal level of how we're going to deal with this. My proposal, for example, is that, like other society things in life, it'll be possible at the age of 21 just to change your name because all that recorded history of you as a teenager, you can just deny it. You know, that's not me. I didn't look it. I don't look like that anymore. I wasn't there. I'm not guilty. I mean, these are fundamental societal issues we have to face. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff we can, take, <laughs> we can drill down. Raise your hand if you were a well-behaved teenager. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, tell the truth. Well, I was in the 60s. But I mean, the, 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 I guess just one more Google question, because I mean, Google really does have this sort of core belief about the power of data to make the world a better place. So uh, even though some people question certain things you do, clearly you've made our lives hugely more efficient, everyone in this room, without any question, and everyone who might be listening to anything coming out of this room. Uh, you're probably the most centrally used technology service. Uh, um, but but um, I guess I just want you to go a little bit further down this path of, you know, can the world be turned into tech? I mean, are you fundamentally optimistic about how we are going to be able to incorporate tech technology in the broadest possible sense in the ways that Kevin talks about it to deal with global uh, climate change and these uh, issues I do. that we're... And, and partly it's because there's things that we can do now that we couldn't do before. You can, in fact, measure where people are and where things are down to the inch. You can actually know the answer to questions of did everyone actually get the service or use it? Uh, and much of government and much of politics has been around estimates. Well, now we can actually know. We can actually track the spread of disease uh, we can actually predict outcomes and so forth. And overall, that will make the world a better place. And I think in, if you go back to Kevin's argument, you are in fact seeing that as a result of collective intelligence, he has a more elegant way of articulating it, does in fact move society quite a bit forward. Okay. Lisa, I mean, a lot of people say, what's a theoretical physicist doing on this panel? I think you even wondered that. Um, <laughs> and thank you for indulging us anyway. But now, when you, when you hear our, what, we're, what we're saying up here, as a, as a really serious scientist, how does it relate to what you do in your mind? Well, first of all, I mean, it's clear that technology has may, had a huge impact. And I think the sort of scale and, and pace of change is, is enormous and impressive. What, but the, the, even the word centrality of technology gets at the fact that technology is neither the beginning nor the end, in the sense that what are, what are the questions we want to do and what are the big seed changes that enter into technology that then exponentiate? And what are the incentives we have to do the right thing? It's, it's really easy to get distracted by gadgets because people like them, it's profitable. And how do you keep going forward with, with the really big issues? And I think, you know, uh, Kevin said that uh, I think technology is the most powerful force, but then I think in that case, physics should be interpreted as sort of the creator of the most powerful force. Um, because it, it was really interesting preparing this to realize that, first of all, um, well, the tr the, all of electronics is based on transistor technology now, which came out of understanding quantum mechanics. I mean, quantum mechanics, I mean, nothing could see have seen further from, ap from having applications. It was really a very basic understanding of what's going on at an atomic scale. And seriously, people that were looking at that, they did not think about having applications in mind. They were really doing pure science. And in fact, against their will, they were forced into these premises. They had no applications in mind. Um, the World Wide Web came about, and, and one could argue it would have come about in other ways, and it probably would have. But the fact is, it came about from a bunch of particle physicists at CERN, where the Large Hadron Collider now happens, where protons collide. But it was because scientists were working together internationally and needed a, a format, a platform, where they could all work together on the same experiment, even though they were in different places. And, you know, it, and it goes on and on. If you think about electronics, I mean, just the discovery of the electron, who really thought that would be useful? even back then. And it's hard to get back into that mindset because we so integrate it into the way we do things and it happens so quickly. I mean, electricity, it's changed the face of the planet. All of these basic discoveries were not done with an eye to technology in mind, yet that's really where we all are. And so I think it's very easy to lose track of that and sort of the, the speed and um, excitement of technology to, to remember that there's all these basic science issues that we need room for, we need time for them. And so in some ways, I would argue that the boundaries are good that we should have this different time scale and this different investment 
that we have in sort of long term. But then at the end of the day, we really want the incentive structure to be such that we all can really move towards the goals, that there's a real way that we're all going to do that. Well, how